Mosh Money team. That's me and you and everyone else listening. <laughs> and everybody who <laughs> likes to make that sh money. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us for another episode of Colorful Lives presented by State Farm. Whether you're thinking about a DIY project, side hustle, or self employment, we're here to help you take it to the next level and learn to trust the process. Now, over the last four episodes, you know we gave a lot of advice to entrepreneurs and to people trying to get ahead in their careers. But we haven't forgotten all of you out there who are looking to step up your side hustle. I wouldn't be where I am today without my side hustle. I mean, you either. My side hustle is my main hustle now, so it's pretty fun. All right, well, today we're going to talk about how to prepare to take that plunge from the rat race into hustling for yourself. And we're going to teach you how to do a SWOT analysis so you can take inventory of your strengths and weaknesses. And maximize your potential. Okay. Before we get into all of that, it's accountability time. Um, I'm feeling a little down about accountability today because I feel like I didn't get as much done as I wanted to get done. Well, you have a tour coming up. That's true. Um, so here's what's going on with me. We're, set, we're currently setting up the tour for Call Your Girlfriend, my main podcast, in the fall. It's this little, is your side hustle? My side hustle. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're, my, you're, my, you're my podcast side piece. Oh, um, great place to be. It, listen, I get treated well on the holidays. <laughs> you, treat, you treat me right. So, you know, this, we're going to keep this going. Um, so that's going really well. Also, just like gearing up. You know the problem with like when you have all these long-term plans and you plug away a little bit, it just doesn't seem like it's coming along. Right. So it's like that. It's like the tour is not until fall. We have to plan merchandise. That's not until the summer. But every day a little bit happens. And I'm like, when the summer comes and when the fall comes, we'll be glad that we spent all this time. But for now, it just feels like nothing is happening. But that's a big deal to know that it's coming in the fall and so you can work backwards from that timeline. Mm -hmm. So that's really important too. Yeah, how's your detox going? Well, I finished my detox, I'm happy to say. And I have to say, that was a huge deal for me. It's the first time in my life I've ever done a detox. I didn't know I would be able to stick it through. Yeah, this woman is glowing. 14 glowing. days of no food. It was a 14-day fast. And when I say no food, I mean no food. Yeah, you were living off of coconut water. Huh? Yes, coconut water, herbal supplements. And then we would have this structured water that was like Himalayan salt, lemon, <laughs> and chlorophyll drops. And water so I'm happy to say though that I did complete it and so my body is not as toxic as I thought it was because there were a lot of side effects I thought would happen to me mm -hmm. and they didn't the only side effect was that I'm hungry okay <laughs> we're gonna go to Red Lobster I'm gonna treat you right after this all right buffet um, style <laughs> buffet style. <laughs> but we are now that I can do things again and be active. You know, we still have our fitness goals that we have to achieve. So. It's true. We got to get out more on the track. That's going to happen. You know, <laughs> your girl, your girl's the hardest working cancer patient in America. So. Don't say on the track like that. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's something else. <laughs> I feel it's true, but I feel like you run all the time. Like I that's the track. I mean, but yes, you run all the time. And you're going too soon too. Um, I, you know, I already told you this. Hey, I know that jogging is good for you, but at what price? Accountability. <laughs> okay, fine. a little walk. Walk, jog, Fine. walk, jog, walk, jog. Okay, we only really have one episode left. Do you feel that overall we're we're doing well and that we're on track to like achieve some big things? It's only what like March. Well, I think it's important that we did challenge ourselves and come up with uh, goals that are attainable mm -hmm. if we put our mind into it and actually do the work. And I told you I was writing before, so I did. Um, finish this little short screenplay that I did. So I'm yes. excited about that. So I'm getting everything in place. So that should be really fun. So I'm happy about that. It's just important for me to give myself things that I'm excited to finish. There's smaller things and then there's bigger things, you know, so. Where do you find the time? I feel like you do 20 things in the day. On the flights <laughs> and in between. <laughs> and anytime I have some downtime, it's nice to be able to do things that I want to do for myself. That's my free time. Instead of running around doing this, doing that, that's my fair. downtime is me handling business for myself. Like that's fair. That's fair. Sometimes you got to do admin day for your own self. So now let's get into a lot of people listening because they have one major goal, right? Mm -hmm. How do you use that passion and skills you already have to build a successful side hustle? Man, I feel I feel good about the side hustle, but I feel a little conflicted about the side hustle mm -hmm. in the sense that today now. Everybody wants to have a side hustle because side hustles look good and they look easy and all this stuff. But the truth is that 
I feel that unless you have real skill somewhere else and that you're a little secure and you're actually like the thing that pays your bills every day mm-hmm. is probably not a great idea to be pursuing a side hustle. So you're not going to be like 22 out of college mm-hmm. working at your day job and then being like, I'm going to be this other thing. It's like, put your head down, do a little bit of work. Well, I have always had a side hustle. I have to say. That's true. That's been my entire life story. Like, I remember just my first job and not making enough money at all, period, having to have a side hustle. And fortunately for me, I've always had the ability to write. That was a skill and a passion I had because since I was young, I've always wanted to be a writer. So I would write bios for people and get paid some money here and there. I remember charging like $500 for labels and up to $1,000 sometimes. And that was a lot of money for me when I was trying to get some extra money just to be able to pay bills and pay rent so that was one of my first side hustles I ever did is I wrote a lot of bios for people and that was something that I was pretty good at and I could knock it out pretty easily Mm -hmm. I would interview the person over the phone then write up the bio and hand it in and the turnaround time was so quick I got recommended to do a lot of things like a lot of labels were like oh let's just get Angela to do the bio she did this person this person and this person so that actually worked out rather well for me because it wasn't so time consuming and it was great for my resume and I think with side hustles what's really important is to do things that matter to you Mm -hmm. it's not just doing a side hustle because I want to make some extra cash it's doing a side hustle because yes I want to make some extra cash but I also want to hone these skills that I care about exactly no Mm -hmm. I mean and I think that that's kind of the deeper point that I wanted to get into is that You can't just say that you want to do a side hustle. You want to be an entrepreneur for the sake of entrepreneur. It's like you actually have to have something that you care about because to do something for so long that you're not getting paid for, that you kind of don't know where it's going, you really have to care. So how did you know what you cared about? I mean, I just say, okay, this is going to be my side hustle. Man, I just like, I think I was just always a very curious kid and I like learning things. One of my very first jobs that I had was working in uh, telemarketing. I (laughs) So I I sell microwaves and knives over the phone. You could sell me anything. Oh, my God. I would sell all these things. But then, like, the thing, the skill that I didn't realize that I had built is that I was actually very good at marketing. Mm -hmm. And I, like, didn't study marketing in college, whatever. And then every job I had where they were like, oh, we need a marketing person. I was like, I didn't sell anything. If I could sell microwaves. Go ahead. (laughs) Pitch to me. Pitch to me. um, What do you want me to pitch you? You want to play Shark Tank right now? Pitch to me a microwave. Try to sell me a microwave. I want to hear it. Well, you're not the demographic for a microwave. I need you gotta microwaves. be a little older. Here's the secret. You gotta call the old people between five and six. So before <laughs> their shows start, they're a little lonely. They want to talk to you. <laughs> the kids don't come visit them. This is Europe. Cold outside. Um, yeah, so like for me, it was that. And I, I think that for me, when also I think about a side hustle, I have very specific skills that I want to learn. Mm-hmm. Like this podcast, a side hustle for me because I wanted to level up my interviewing skills and, um, and just like become even more comfortable on the microphone than I am and it's like working with somebody like you who does radio all the time it's like great like it's gonna push me it's gonna push me to get there and so that's always for me what's in the back of my mind is I'm just like what is the like I did I couldn't go to grad school because I didn't have enough money to go I was supporting my siblings and so I really like committed myself to like everything has to be a learning opportunity or it's not worth it that's important that you said that because I always looked at you as kind of an expert in what it is that you do because of your podcast. Not like somebody would be like, oh, I need to level up my skills. Uh, I learned all this on Google University. (laughs) But I have to say, that's something that everybody should learn because we can all always be doing better and always learning more. And that's important too when it comes to side hustles. Sometimes your side hustle isn't going to make you the money that you want to make right away, but it's the experience that you can Mm -hmm. get from doing those things that are really important. So I think when you're trying to establish yourself and figure out what you want to do in life, having that side hustle should serve the purpose of making you money and giving you experience that's the ideal situation but sometimes your side hustle is not necessarily so lucrative but in the long term is something that could really gain you something from the relationships that you created and the experience that you created from doing that side hustle it's all about maybe having something that's the core of what you do but then the side hustle is something that I love that I want to make into something bigger hopefully yeah. and it also just like teaches you how to run yourself and run the business of yourself you know it's like if you're not good at time management your side hustle is going to suffer if you're not good at networking your side hustle is going to suffer if you're not good at 
a million other things. But the thing about like working for yourself is that there's a lot of grace there and there's a lot of forgiveness. You're not spending somebody else's money. And ultimately you have to do it to edify yourself. Right. And you and the thing about it, too, is that like if you care so much about something like the day is going to come that you look at your day job in the face and you're like, actually, I'm ready to fly my own wings and I can do this, you know, and I like I don't know. I love quitting jobs. It's the most <laughs> thrilling thing oh in the gosh, world. Oh, my gosh. I get anxiety from that. Oh, my God. I love quitting jobs. I like practice in the mirror. I'm like, bye. Like, I am not even here. I already downloaded all the files on my computer. Anytime I give two weeks notice, I'm ready to go that the day. The best thing. Yeah, me too. <laughs> the best thing to do. I remember quitting a job and I remember... They wanted me to stay, and I already had signed on somewhere else. And I remember saying, I made some outrageous demands that I knew they couldn't do. And then I was like, oh, well, I'm sorry, then I'm going to have to leave. And I was like, ha ha. But what if they would have said yes <laughs> to my outrageous demands? Right? But it's really nice to know that you don't have to work somewhere because you need to, mm-hmm. but because you want to. And to know that if I leave here or if this doesn't work out or if they fire me, I know I'm good because my side hustles actually can cover everything that I need them to cover. And now I can dedicate more time to that. So what side hustles do you have? Or are you currently doing, Amina? Um, podcasting. Hey. I'm a multi-podcast host. That's a side hustle that I do. I also consult on the side for a lot of companies who are trying to take their businesses public or who need help, like, taking a, a product to market. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I know how to do that. And right. anytime, and you know, and it is a really good feeling that sometimes I'm like, I'll look at my budget and I'm like, ooh, I need a little bit more, more money for this. Or I, you know, like, my family has an emergency like I need money for that it's such a good feeling to be like I can rely on one of these things pick up a project do it and it's good right the other thing too that all of this makes me think about is that a a lot of the entrepreneurs that we've talked on the show to so far, they all talk about like how they all like were saving a little bit of money from their day job before they fly on their own wings. And I feel that like that kind of financial discipline that you're learning incrementally is what gives you the confidence that right. you can finally do it. Right. Where it's like it's not like you have to save a million dollars. But if you're like, whoa. I can actually pay my rent for two months. I can do this. Like, I'm going to eat. I'm not going to starve. Where you feel confident enough that you can do that and you learn you learn how to take care of yourself. Well, I have a million different side hustles right now. Aside from doing my show on The Breakfast Club, I also do a lot of panels. I do a lot of hostings mm-hmm. for events. I do media training for artists. I still write here and there. Wow. And then I have my juice bar, of course, also. And we book a lot of events at the juice bar as well. So it's just a lot of different things that I've been doing. I've been making a lot of money off of social media, too. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's I uh, love those sponsor posts. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, but what you'll notice is the core of everything that, that I do does center around the Breakfast Club yep. and that job, and it all kind of helps grow that brand for Exactly. Me. So my side hustles are actually just helping this ball get bigger and bigger and bigger of the core of what I do. So that's been important. And it also is important to make sure that you're very organized because when you have to do these side hustles, you have to make sure you're following up with people. You have to get your invoices oh, right because, I- you know, chasing money is always one of my pet peeve things I hate having my to My dream people. business to do, honestly, is to quit all of my side hustles and to be the money chaser for other people's businesses. <laughs> yes. I'm like, and then you give me a cut. I'm so good at invoice day. I love it. I'm like, I email you. If you don't get back to me, I'm going to email your boss and then I'm going to email his boss. But, you know, it's... A, but it's. <laughs> Can I talk to you after this? <laughs> yes, talk to me. But, you know, but it is something to really consider is that, mm-hmm. like, if you drop the ball on, on your own self... It has so many repercussions down the line, right? It's like if people are going to take 90 days to pay you, well, if you don't get your invoice in on time, that's what you're looking at. And you have to manage your own cash flow. You got to manage your own schedule. Just because you're doing five side hustles, you literally cannot drop the ball for other people because other people depend on you. And you might have eight invoices out. You have to make sure you remember when those payments are due to come into you. Make sure you follow up. And there's software that you can use Mm -hmm. for that, right? It's like you don't have to stress yourself out. There's literally software. You can also hire somebody to like be a part-time assistant for you, somebody to do bookkeeping for you. The best two people that I've hired on my team are a bookkeeper and an accountant because those are the places that I suffer where every quarter I just take a 
plastic bag full of receipts and I'm very ashamed right. and I'm like actually I don't have this problem anymore that's better than people who don't have any receipts at all and they're just trying to tell you right I'm like that's now good. I don't have I'm this problem I'm glad you have anymore. it all organized like that that's why things like a financial planner is really important having an accountant is really important sometimes people think those are only for people that have like millions of dollars but nope. it's really beneficial for the average person so that you can get on track to get to those millions of dollars yeah the first time I got an accountant I'm pretty sure I owed the IRS a lot of <laughs> money and you know but again it's like we and we've talked about this so many times it's an investment in yourself mm -hmm. right so you need to spend money to like figure all of this right. stuff instead out instead of paying those penalties you could have spent that money <laughs> listen um one way also that you can stay kind of organized and figure out like what your side hustle is going to be and get it to be really successful is to use this thing that uh, everybody who goes to business school knows about a SWOT analysis I clearly didn't go to business school listen I went to Google business school <laughs> we do SWOT analysis once a year with call your girlfriend my other podcast we uh We have a business retreat. It's literally five days, sit down. Like, there's a lot of, like, swimming and hanging out and cooking, but then there's literally, like, what does the year look like? Editorial calendar, planning, all that stuff. And we do a SWOT analysis. So SWOT right. is the S is for strengths, the W is for weaknesses, the O is for opportunities, and the T is for threats. Sheesh. So you literally go through whatever your idea is, and you're like, what are the strengths? Like, that's the first quadrant, right? So that means, like, what do you do well? What are your skills? What do you do better than your competitors? weaknesses like what's what can you improve about this idea what are the cost time money that stuff what resources do you need that you mm -hmm. don't have available to you right exactly. now exactly why do you need further education in certain things or more exactly. experience exactly and what ends up costing you time and or money exactly and then the O is for opportunities and this to me is the most exciting part of the SWOT analysis because it's when your creativity really gets to run and you're like oh I'm doing this small thing now but one day it can be a bigger part of this here's how we can market it um, you know you figure out what your targets your target audiences are how could, like can you use technology to enhance your business how are people searching online can you do some sort of optimization so that's like the really the thinking corner of your business and then the T is threats which are like What obstacles are you facing? Is there a competitor that does the exact same thing that you do and they're further ahead? Is there, you know, like, is the economy about to tank and your idea for some, like, party business is not going to be sustainable? What's going on in your industry? And the thing is, like, this is super easy. You can literally Google it. There are so many forms. But really sitting down to do this shows that you're serious about what you're doing and that you've thought about it. Right. Because you can't constantly be catching up. You have to anticipate things. You have to anticipate threats. You have to anticipate opportunities. You have to be ready. You have to compensate for your weaknesses. And unless you write them all out, like you're not going to be thinking about them constantly. We've seen so many situations where these big corporations thought that they were number one and they would always be number one and never considered mm -hmm. the smaller company coming in as a threat and then they overtook them. So that's great. As a matter of fact, even as we were going through this, I had a billion different things that I would do for my own spot analysis so I'm excited to actually get mine going right you think that like Blockbuster saw Netflix coming um, <laughs> let me tell you something I used to have a boyfriend that worked at Blockbuster when I was in high school okay I've seen every movie back then <laughs> I definitely I mean listen there's just so many situations where that happens and it can put a company completely out of business I remember having a TiVo remember TiVo yes oh for like gosh. a minute everybody had TiVo FYI mine had the lifetime subscription Well, so I'm so mad that <laughs> and I still have the TV you think right. it's worth anything I don't know maybe on like eBay for like a 90s museum or something so for people who don't know it. what a TV it was not was it in the 90s oh it was it's the 2000s it was it like was, late was. 90s early 2000s for people who don't know what TV is <laughs> every millennial it's a DVR okay they might not know right but it's the like TV it's DVR old. that didn't come with your cable right so you had to buy this other DVR machine and then they started putting DVR in every Everything. And then so you're like, damn, well, no more TiVo. <laughs> yeah, you know, and th there's so many things like that. And you're just like, if you really just sit down and think about it and you have to constantly refresh it and do it. Right. And being in like the know of what your business is, is how you figure that out. All right. Well, that was some great examples. <laughs> I know. That's some threats. <laughs> okay. What are some kind of easy ways that you can take your, your side hustle to the next level? I'm embarrassed to say this, but I don't have a business card. 
but that's part of my mystique. But it is on my to-do list to get business, business cards. I don't have a business card either. And I always feel like no one has those, but then everybody's always like, you have a business card? Yes. Oh, my God. People, especially when you go to networking conferences and stuff like that, people are always asking for business cards. Oh, we should design some really cool ones. I know. Because I definitely don't have a... I, haven't had, I remember my first job ever. I was so excited when I got business cards. <laughs> <laughs> and and now look at me. You know, you also need to like build and develop your digital presence. I think that you and I are there. So that's also probably why we feel like we don't need business cards. Right. Because Google me. That's right. <laughs> Google me, baby. I'm Amina. Um, you know, but like you need a website. It, and it depends what you're doing, right? But like I... It's like you need a website. One place where when people go, who is Angela Yee? Mm -hmm. It just like pulls it up for them. They know how to contact you. If they have a business opportunity for you, they can do it. It's like, think about it as like not leaving money on the table. There are people right. who want to give you money and they need to get in touch with you and they need a quick answer for what does this person do? Unfortunately, I did start my website for myself back when I worked at Sirius and that was probably about like when I started it maybe like 11 years ago. And the point of that was for it to really be my online resume, mm -hmm. like everything I've ever done, every interview I've ever done, anybody that's ever interviewed me for something, just anything like that is all available like on yeah. my on my website. So I can always send people there and they can look on that to see anything they need to see about what I've done over the past over 10 years. Exactly. And you never know like who is looking for you, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to make it easy for them. The other thing too about like having all of this stuff, a digital presence, is that you actually get to look at metrics. Right. It's like, is your social media growing that means people are engaging with you more are more people coming to your website and that's all the kind of business acumen that you're going to need anyway so you need to really treat yourself that way and then you know the next thing is really like you just you got to make money so <laughs> That, you know, it sounds really easy, but, you know, maybe the secret to making money is that you need to work smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what can you monetize? What are the first couple of things that you can go out the gate? And um, there's a lot of things that we pay for also that we don't need. Oh, yeah. Like I have all kinds of like subscriptions and memberships. IMDB and Pro just dropped it. <laughs> I don't use. And I'm like, why do I have a subscription? Mm -hmm. And I look at like things that come out of my credit card every month. And I'm like, OK, this is out of here. OK, I haven't been to this gym in over a year let me cut off yeah. the subscription and sometimes they make it so hard my gym is like you have to come down here and like oh, yeah. Gyms are do like it in, per in person or whatever you gotta come here you gotta get three judges to sign this for you yeah. <laughs> you gotta get the mayor on board yeah, it was no. crazy but it is important to make sure you cut out all that extra money that you know if you have five streaming services maybe you don't need all five mm -hmm. and or you just like subscribe to a service that you needed for business like mm -hmm. I don't know you know like something like a legal service or like an accounting service. Um, one reason that all of this thinking for me actually now is second nature is because I'm like 100% freelancer, right? So I do my own HR. I do my own payroll. In fact, I got to do payroll after we record this because <laughs> your girl got to get paid. And it's just, you just really have to get into that mindset for yourself, right? So there are days where I'm like, today is a work day and I'm producing work. But there are days where I sit down and I'm like, today is for the business. Mm -hmm. I need to do accounting. I need to do invoicing. I need to do receipts. I need to actually pay myself. I need to pay all my vendors. I need to make sure that I have enough work that I can pay myself next month. Right. I need to get current with the IRS. So I think that like getting into that kind of thinking is really important. And when you're a freelancer, like a lot of people think like, oh, freelance, I get to work from home. No. Let me tell you. Working from home is hard. Working sometimes. from home is so hard. It takes a lot of discipline. I have to I have to leave the house personally. Because it's like every morning I have to take a shower, I have to get dressed, and I have to leave the house. Otherwise, I'm just going to sit on the couch and do nothing. Mm -hmm. But it's also this thing where people think that like, oh, work is just going to come your way. No, yeah, it all. means that you have to hustle. Like you are, you're doing all of the functions that your old job used to do for you. Now you're responsible for all of that. And you also have to make sure that every single one of your clients or whoever you're working for feels like they are the top priority. Because mm -hmm. you never want to have to say, oh, well, I can't make it there because I have to do this for someone else. You have to make every person feel like they are special. They are the top priority. And sometimes that's stroking a lot of egos. That's just making sure that that you can prove that you can go above and beyond because those references are what's going to keep your business afloat also. Yeah. You don't want people to say, I had a terrible experience working with Angela and so you shouldn't hire her because it is a network of people in this business that speak to each other. Yeah. And so 
you can Google somebody online and somebody will be like, oh, she was awful. You don't want things like that to happen. Right. And th- I think that that's a thing, too, that a lot of people don't think about. Like, you're, when you work for yourself, your reputation is even more important than when you're working at a corporation. You can't blame anyone but yourself. You can't blame anybody. But also, like, people will literally not trust you because right. the reason that they're coming to you is because you're a small operation and you're supposed to give them, like, FaceTime and service and all of this stuff. So if you can't do that, it literally will have very serious ramifications for you. I remember but there was a time when I all I did was freelance and I had four different clients and I was bouncing around from one to the other and I remember one company I actually um, quit working at this one company and then one of their clients hit me up directly and was like we were only using them because we really liked you can we work with you directly and that's why it's always important to put your best foot forward even if you feel like I'm not getting paid when I want to get paid my whole thing is if I agree to do something then I'm going to do it to the best of my ability whether you're paying me five dollars or five million dollars then I'm still going to put the same fourth effort that I would put because my name is on the line, no yep. matter what, always. So if I say yes, I'm going to help you with this and I will deliver this, 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 and that, I don't care if I'm not getting paid what I think I should get paid. I'm still going to do the work that I agreed and committed to put in. Yeah, and okay, the next rule that I tell everybody that I'm like, this is the number one rule of freelance. If you break this rule, everything was, will fail. Never work without a contract. Right. Don't work with somebody on a handshake. Don't start work until until you know what the structure is of the work, how they're going to pay you, and how much they're going to pay you. And, you know, a lot of people think about contracts and they're just like, no, you can trust me, you can whatever. Contracts are to protect everybody. It protects the the person that is receiving right. the work and it protects the person that is doing the work. I can't tell you how many times I've started a project and then the client will say, actually, I want this, this, and this. And then we'll go to the contract. And I'm like, no, here's what the statement of work says. You guys drew this up yourself. <laughs> and you're saying that I'm not going to do more work for you. If you want me to do more work, you can pay me right. to do that for you. Because you're, all of your, your minutes, like, count so much more i um i track my time in 15 minute increments because i need to know how much work i'm producing at all at all times you're also getting paid fairly irregularly if Mm -hmm. you're a freelancer so if you mess up one contract well guess what you're not gonna pay your rent that month and it's important to set those terms on when you're getting paid and try to make them work to your benefit always i usually when i was doing things would try to get paid up front as much as possible or at least half up front and then the other half once you deliver but what i did do sometimes if i was able to was get paid for the following month yeah so if if for the month of february pay me february 1st and that's for the month of february so i'm not waiting to the end of the month for all the work i did to get paid for yeah i mean and you know pay Payment terms are really important. And that's the other thing about if you drop the contract, you can decide for yourself, like, I want to be paid in net 60 days or I want to be paid in net 90 days. Mm-hmm. I The way that I run my business, I don't start any work unless you give me 25% up front. Right. It's like that's just how it works. And uh, and I'm lucky that I've, like, done this long enough. I have a long enough list of clients that, like, people trust me. I can do this. I, that's not how I started off. Mm-hmm. But now I'm at this place where I'm like, well, you know, like, if it goes badly or not, I don't see another dollar from this contract, at least I saw this quarter percentage because I there's so many horror stories like that where you'll oh, do I was the work say, I've seen so many yeah. stories of people, people you'll do the really work and the money never comes that never got paid for certain things that they did they did and then oh what if the company goes bankrupt or mm-hmm. you can't find the person they the go the person and you disappears got you're because you're your own HR accounting payroll everything when you're working with those other people there's literally a hundred people that you have and to chase after and sometimes I know people that contract other people out to do certain work for a client and now they're out money or they had to buy things or invest mm-hmm. in other things to make something happen and you're using your own money for that and that shouldn't have to happen. Yeah, you know, and for when I started my own freelance business, the rule that I gave myself is that I needed um, enough money to live for three months. Where I was like, if anything happens, I don't get a single job. I literally sit here every day and watch Spongebob. I need to be <laughs> able to pay for three months of my bills, my rent, and all of my expenses. And that was my savings target. And that was really good for me because now in the back of my mind, that's always my emergency stash Mm -hmm. that I have to have saved because you never know. It's like some months you'll work a lot. Like right now I'm sick and I'm not working as much as I used to. 
but I can do, I can still live the exact same quality of life that I have because I have planned for all of this stuff, you know? And so you really need to think about yourself that way. You need to save for retirement just because you're freelance mm-hmm. doesn't mean that you can't save for retirement. There are a lot of retirement savings accounts that you can look up, talk to a financial planner about. Um, you need to pay your taxes oh, on a yes. quarterly. <laughs> Let me tell you, four times a year. And you have to set aside that money to be able to pay your you, taxes. Every check that I get, 25% goes immediately to tax funds. Like, it, the check can be small or it can be big. I'm just like 25%. Taxes. And the thing is that, like, a lot of times my taxes are more than that. It's like, you look up self-employment tax, whatever. This is why you get an accountant mm-hmm. and they do it. The, the other thing about paying the taxes quarterly means that at the end of the year, you don't have to write one big painful check that you <laughs> really hadn't saved for right. the entire time. So you learn a lot about yourself. It's all about planning. <laughs> It is all about planning. It's like you're not going to go hungry if you plan ahead. Otherwise, it's going to be real cold and lonely for you out there. Colorful Lives presented by State Farm to help you increase your financial IQ and to bring your career, business and life to the next level. Every other week, we're getting together and offering up advice and inspiration to help you up your financial IQ with our new season of Colorful Lives. If you're liking what you're hearing, we'd love it if you could rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, or Spotify. It only takes a few seconds, and it makes a huge difference in helping more people find out about the show. And if you really want to support the show, we're not asking for any handouts. We just ask that you put a friend on to your favorite episode. So don't forget, you can get into the conversation on social media just use the hashtag hashtag live colorful with two l's at the end of colorful this episode we talked all about self-employment and side hustles so we figured who better to chat with than the host of switch pivot or quit podcast ayana angel ayana has enjoyed success in many different artistic mediums as the creator of a jewelry line crux that was featured in vogue worn by beyonce alicia keys and lauren hill that's amazing right Mm -hmm. ayana is also the author of a book called 365 Inspirations for the Soul of the Side Hustler and the Entrepreneur, and a novel titled In His Heart. Before she decided to strike out on her own, Ayana put work in as a publicist with the NBA. Hi, Ayana. Thanks for joining us today. Before we get into what you've got going on now, I want to talk a little bit more about your past life as a publicist in the NBA. When did you decide you wanted to transition into doing your own thing, and how did you prepare to take the plunge? Uh, I decided, well, I had this, this burning to make a switch pivot or quit before I even knew it was a thing about two years before I actually did it. And I ended up uh, just doing all types of like things that would sort of help push me in the direction of figuring out what my next move would be. And in about 2013, August 2013 or July, that's when I finally just like made the decision, told them I'm out and um, and just really took that leap. And how I prepared for it was I was writing a manuscript at the time I was working on my first book. So about nine months prior to me actually telling them that I was leaving, I had been working on that book like every night, every weekend, and I knew that I was almost done with it. So I just prepared in the way that I didn't know what was going to happen, but I was very confident in myself and the storyline. And I said, I'm going to get this book traditionally published. And that was my goal. And it happened. So now you also have done a lot of different things besides being a publicist in the NBA in your past life. And you've also said that people have always come to you for advice about things. So you kind of knew that that was your calling. So let's talk about all of those things that you've done and just kind of um, being so well-rounded. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, you know what? I, I It really didn't dawn on me that people really come to me until actually after I left the NBA because I started to notice this trend. And then once people started to hear about my story, how I left, look, in the beginning, I wasn't doing this for anybody but myself and my sanity. Like I knew I needed a change, but people were inspired by my story. And so they were coming to me. They wanted advice. They wanted to know how I did it. And then I just recognized there was this pattern like throughout the years, people would just come to me and ask me questions about things that I'm like, how do they even think that I know about this? Mm -hmm. But then I would, I would always have an answer, a solution, a connection, something. So I'm like, okay, that's why they keep coming to me because I always have something for them. So that was one thing that I noticed. And then I'm just a creative and I finally had to embrace that. My parents, well, mainly my dad, he's like, I'm not paying for you to get some kind of creative degree. Like it's just (laughs) not happening. 
it. You know? <laughs> so I knew that wasn't an option. So I picked the next best thing, which to me was marketing. And, and, and that allowed me to have some type of creative outlet. That's why I was drawn to PR because it allowed me to creatively write, to create, you know, headlines and different things like that. So, um, during the course of working at the NBA and living in New York, New York just has this vibe and this energy about it where you feel like, what am I doing if I'm only doing one thing? So for me, I said, you know what, I got to figure out what else, you know, I could be doing like on the side. And mm-hmm. that ended up being jewelry. And so I cre- co-created this jewelry line, which has some, some dope, um, success, I guess you could say. And that was fun. And that really let me know, like, there's more to me than what I'm doing right now. Ayana, and don't I skip over it. the success of people who wear your jewelry and where it was featured, please. Like, uh, <laughs> I don't want to have to pat you on the back, but just let everybody know. <laughs> So um, we actually had Beyonce wear the jewelry and her. Oh, we like just the Beyonce? Yeah, actually Beyonce. Just <laughs> Beyonce. <laughs> yeah, I, want, I, you know, I, I want you to scream I, your accomplishments. Go ahead. Who else? Thank you. We had Solange. We had Marsha Ambrosius. We had it on BET, Rip the Runway, um, Italian Vogue. And I, I can't say we had it. We did have an awesome publicist at the time. His name is Purvis Ross. And he killed it. Like, we didn't even know that he could do what he did with the jewelry. But you know what? Now, looking around, it was ahead of its time. Mm-hmm. Because we were making earrings with shingles on them and stuff, like tassels that you see now. Yeah. That's what that's the kind of stuff we were doing. And so I think for some people and some editors and stuff, they were just like, oh, is this too risky? Like, what is this? But some people bought into it. Luckily, as we all know, King B, she's a, she's always ahead of her time. So people like her, they they were down with it. So, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. Definitely. cool. Um, that's amazing. Also, obviously, like everybody has a different situation when it comes to whether they should switch, pivot or quit. I love that you've coined that for us. Can you help give our listeners some sort of guidance on the answers that they need to seek when they're when they need help to make a major decision like that? Absolutely. You know what? To me, what I found out is that it all comes down to you and getting quiet and understanding what you want. You know, a lot of times when we get out of college, a lot of us are just conditioned to go to college, right? It's like, go to college. That's all you need to do. And then there's this big unknown world out there after. And it's like, well, what am I supposed to do now? You don't really know. So you just start checking the boxes of what you think is expected of you. And then you look up one day and you're like, uh, I'm really not feeling this. Like, what am I supposed to really be doing? You know? So in order for you to figure that out, well, what really helped me was getting quiet and asking myself some real questions. Mm -hmm. Like, what do I really enjoy? What do I really want to do? And then that came back to honoring my, um, my calling, I guess you could say as a creator and my ideas and not trying to push those things down and dumb them down for other people, but to let them really flourish. And for me, that gave me an opportunity to really see where I could fit into this world and what would be aligned with me and what made sense for me. So I think the main thing when you're trying to decide if you want to make a switch, pivot or quit, it's really all about change. You have to be open to change. You have to be willing to push yourself outside of your comfort zone because that change is not going to feel good. It's not always going to feel happy and like, oh my God, this was the best decision ever. No, sometimes it's going to be like, what the heck was I thinking? It's scary. Yes, absolutely. So you just got to get quiet and sit with yourself and start doing some of the personal work so that that can then transfer over into your professional life and you can have more clarity there. And I know you said that people have to trust your gut. And I guess that comes with being quiet, being silent and listening to what your gut is telling you. Mm -hmm, Exactly. And not what everybody else around you is telling you. And that's what I finally had to do because everybody was saying, you work at the NBA. How could you possibly want to leave there? And if I would have bought into that narrative, I'd still be there miserable (laughs) because that's not where I needed to be. You know, yeah, it's cool from the outside. But at the end of the day, it's just another corporate company Mm -hmm. like everywhere else, you know, so you got to do what feels right for you. Well, what was it like going from a stressful professional environment to backpacking around Europe? Oh, it was fun as heck. <laughs> um, it was it was a crazy experience, though, because I was trying to find a flat to live in. Uh, you know, they do a lot of shared housing there. And so I was trying to find an, a flat to live in before I got there. But I couldn't. So I ended up in a hostel. Ooh, so I seen that. Yeah. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. But you know what? The crazy thing, Angela, I had never stayed in a hostel before ever in my life. So the first time I'm going, I'm staying there for an extended time. I was like, what am I thinking? Yeah, what was that like? Because I've only seen it in that movie, so I don't know. 
You know what? It was actually, I actually had to end up moving hostels, but the one that I moved to was really comfortable. It was British people. It was, they were just really, really nice people that owned it and ran it. It was comfortable. And, um, there was a lot of different people there. So I ended up in this long-term room where I shared a room with five other people. It was people from Russia, Paris. Um, it was people from Norway. It was just like people from everywhere and, um, men and women. And we all shared a bathroom and all of that. So my, me, I'm kind of like a neat freak sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what is this about to be like? Uh, I don't even know. But you know what? My friend told me before I actually left and went to London, she said, look, if you are going to do this and have an open mind, then you'll have the best time of your life. But if you're going to do this and think that you're going to have the comfort of America and complain about it, then don't even do it. So I went there with an open mind. So even though staying in a hostel was out of my comfort zone, then I ended up renting a flat, which I didn't know, but it was kind of like equivalent to the hood here. Um, and <laughs> that was, I figured that out once, <laughs> one night the neighbors were fighting. I'm like, should I call the police? Like, what should I bang on the wall? The wall was cement. I couldn't bang on the wall. So then I was, I told my friend, I'm like, yo, it was like a lot of activity. She's like, oh yeah. That, she's like, that's, you live in council housing, which is kind of like the projects. I was like, what? So, <laughs> it was an experience. It definitely was an experience. And it was something that I wouldn't trade for the world. And I knew it was something that I had to do. I love that. I also love that you call yourself the chief encourager. And we <laughs> wanted to highlight all of the ways that you motivate and inspire besides the podcast. Can you talk a little bit more about the I Need New Friends brunch tour? Oh, gosh, that was um, that was fun. That was crazy. It was just like someone that I met online. Her name is Sable. We met online because when my book was out, she wanted to buy a copy and give it to her audience, which was I thought was dope, like a giveaway. So we connected from that. And then we just were talking one day and I was coming to New York and we were going to do some type of event. But things changed. So then we needed a new direction. And it was like, you know what? We were new friends. And, you know, I was just saying, like, sometimes people just need new friends. You know, they need a new environment. They need people that are going to be supportive in a slightly different way. Sometimes your friend circle, it, some people are complacent. They're chill. They like what they have going on. But you might be a bit more ambitious. So you need to surround yourself with people who are like minded. And so that's where sort of the concept for it came. And we had curated seating so that people could be sitting by people that they could potentially have something um that, you know, matched up, like maybe there was a common interest or something. And it was really, really good. And the reception was good. And actually, ironically, someone DM me the other day and said, do you think that you'll ever bring this back? Because I need some new friends. <laughs> so it was a, it was a good time and people really appreciated, um, us creating that experience for them. Well, we're in for when you bring it back, just I so know. you know. Okay, okay ladies. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> We all need new friends. Now, you also use your podcast to develop and nurture a community of women looking for encouragement, empowerment, and motivation. And that's definitely not an easy task. So how do you do it? And what's some of the stories that you've shared on your podcast? You know what? When I decided to do the podcast, actually, it had been about a year prior that I was just thinking about it, but I wasn't clear on the exact direction. And, and being a podcast listener, I said, I got to I got to know what I'm doing, you know, and know what I want to deliver out of this. So then it just dawned on me one day. I'm like, you need to speak to people that are in a similar situation to what you were in. You need that. You need to create that content that you would have wanted to listen to when you were sitting at your desk thinking, I cannot wait to get out of here, you know? So for me, it all started to be just very organic and women just started coming in droves, emailing me, wanting to share their story, wanting to share their experiences. And um, I had a young lady, Dana Bolden, on the podcast who uh, is a, she was doing her thing, working at Under Armour in marketing. And then also on the side, she's a fashion blogger. And I, I saw her, um, her glow up, if you will, because she was also one of our special featured guests in D.C. at the I Need 
new friends brunch. So when she finally announced that she was actually leaving her job, um, it was crazy. And I got to talk to her and the inspiration that she gave women from hearing her story. It was just, it was ridiculous. And I think that she has such a, um, a grounded perspective on things and this, just this light that draws people to her, that people were just proud of her. And I was proud to be able to help her share her story because I was one of the first, oh, I was the first podcast that she interviewed that she did to sort of talk to the world in a more candid way about what she did, how she prepared to do it and those types of things. And the same thing happened with, um, Dana Blair, who used to Mm -hmm. host Essence Live. Yes. I love Dana Blair. Yeah, yeah, she's good people. And so she came on and shared her story too. And the other thing that I really like about Dana's story is that it's still evolving, you know? So it's not to say that you have to make a switch, pivot, or quit and everything has to be perfect. I want to share people's stories and let other the listeners have an insight as to what the possibilities are. It's not saying because I did it this way, do it this way. It's just saying this is an idea. This is a potential. This is maybe a direction you could go in. And it's just opening up that conversation so that women don't feel alone when they're feeling like they want to make a switch, pivot or quit because your friend circle might not always be in the same space. And then they're looking at you like, girl, just be happy. Just be happy. You got a job. And you're like, but no, I I'm want more. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So for me, everything with the Switch, Pivot, or Quit podcast has been very organic. And I really appreciate it because women DM, DM me and email me and everything. Like every day they screenshot themselves listening to it. And I'm like, I didn't know that this was going to happen. But this just this is that fulfillment that I think I was looking for and I knew I was missing when I was at the NBA. Just helping people and making an impact by just sharing. You wrote the book on side hustling with 365 inspirations for the soul of the side hustler and the entrepreneur. I love that. Can you Thank share you. can you share some gems with us? Uh, you know what? That book, I just felt like daily sometimes um we need something that's just going to just boost us, you know, just, just kind of push us in the right direction. And it was really, I don't, I can't even tell you that I remember anything that I specifically wrote in there because I was just flowing and going and just saying stuff that I thought I would want to hear and that other people would want to hear, you know, it was just like all about uplifting and encouraging someone out of the space that they're potentially in. Now, Amina, let's talk about you because you're writing a book with your podcast partner. (laughs) Girl. And you've already written a couple, both self-published and traditionally published. So let's talk about the two of you and writing and promoting your books. I mean, I am in like in the thick of doing the side hustle of like trying to sell the book right now. The proposal's Mm. done, that Mm -hmm. stuff. And it's. You know, it's going really well, and I'm really proud of myself that we're, like, meeting all of our deadlines. But, wow, it's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work. And then when you look at it, you're like, oh, it's actually, like, a year and two years of work. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not just, Mm -hmm. like, a you're going to sit down. It's like, you got to sell it, and then you have to write it, and then you have to promote it. Like, what's your experience been like? Right. You know, the first book that I did was fiction. So it was slightly different in that I had to write it first. Oh, yeah. Um, Because you got to write like novels that you got to write it all out before you sell it. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And then you have to start shopping it around to literary agents. And I did that. And that was one hell of an experience because I didn't know what I was doing. I only knew one other person that had written a book that I like knew in real life, which was Demetria Lucas. And and I saw her experience, but I didn't know the ins and outs of it. So I didn't really know what I was doing. A Bella so BK, just, Demetria. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, exactly, exactly. And so I saw her experience like from the outside being at her book launch party and everything. And I saw what she had to do. And she told me that it was going to be a lot of work and that don't basically don't count on anybody else. Like you're going to have to market it, everything yourself. But getting into the process with, um, with trying to find an agent, I remember I was sitting in a conference room at um, finals in Miami and this literary agent, this man had requested my manuscript. He wanted to read a portion of it and I sent it to him and I'm excited because I'm like, this is good. Sometimes they don't even respond to you. So then I get this email while I'm at finals, just hoping this dream's going to come true. And he's like, 
you know, I like the storyline and everything, but the way the work is right now, I can't take it to any of my editors. So I'm going to have to pass. (gasps) I was crushed. I felt like so deflated. I was like, so I'm not good enough. You know, but that was just the first person, right? That was the first person. And that I had to make a decision. Then I said, either you're going to really keep going and you believe in yourself or you're going to let this defeat you. And I said, you know what? I got to keep going. I got to at least try this. So I ended up not even using an agent. I ended up going directly to the publisher because Mm -hmm. I met the publishing director and I said, I'm not ready right now. But when I am, can I send you my manuscript? Because at this point I knew I needed to get it edited. So I did that sent it to her. And then next thing you know, she was like about two weeks later, she was like, we love it. And we want to publish it. (gasps) And yeah. And I was, but you know what? Crazy me. I was so in go mode that I didn't even really realize what was happening. I went to my editor and I'm like, they want to offer me this deal. Like, what should I do? And she's like, Ayana, are you crazy? I know 50 million authors right now who would kill to be in your position. And I was like, oh, really? (laughs) <laughs> okay. Okay. So I should be excited. Okay. Okay. This is good. So, I mean, it's a, it's one hell of a process and just write. That was, that was after I spent all this time writing it. And I think that's the part that people don't pay attention to after I wrote this book and it comes out, everybody's telling you like, Oh, I wanted to write a book. Oh yeah. I was thinking to write about writing a book. Mm-hmm, that's cute. You wrote a book, but I'm like, do it then. Do it. Well, damn, I was about to say, <laughs> I want to write a book. Forget it. No, <laughs> like, it is, no, it's real it. work. It's real work, you no, know? And is. I and I love that you also just talk about, you know, the, the hustle that it is, right? Because you yeah. got to bring in your, you actually have to know how to write. You need to know how yep. to promote. You need to know how to brand yourself and talk about how branding is important. And that's mm-hmm. something that you're really big about talking about, you know? So can you... Tell our audience a little bit more like your thoughts on branding. Absolutely. One of the things that I wish I would have done better before I left the NBA was brand myself as a person, as an individual, like my skill set, all of that um, in the entertainment industry, because I was kind of low key. I was so used to doing the work and pushing other people, namely like the players in the NBA's agenda that I wasn't pushing myself. So when I got out on my own, it was like this learning curve where I was like, uh, there's no time to be like shy, timid, afraid, anything. This is your go time, you know? So I had to start doing things and putting myself out there in a way that I wasn't exactly used to and comfortable with, but it was like either sink or swim, you know? So I had to start doing things like taking photo shoots. Um, I had to start talking myself up to people that needed to know about me. I had to email people on my behalf, you know, like all these things that you might be a little intimidated by, you have to do it. And especially Especially when it came time to promoting that book, I started planning um, these little, I call them sipping sassy like mixers that I was doing even before the book launched because nobody knew me as a writer and I needed them to know me as a writer. They knew me as a, as a publicist. So I started inviting people out to happy hours and curating these experiences. So by the time the book came out, they weren't like, why is she inviting me out somewhere? You know, it was a little more normal for them. So that was a part of my marketing. I started writing for different online publications and I wrote my own bio for the first time. That was a part of me just creating that marketing mix that I needed to start establishing myself. I created a blog, Um, just doing all these things and putting together the assets that, you know, will help serve you later. That's the best thing that you can do. And, you know, for anybody who's listening, who wants to go the traditional publishing route, basically, if you you are not a celebrity author, you cannot count on them marketing your book. Now, Angela, you probably could count on them marketing your book. You know (laughs) what I mean? If you wrote a book because you have a name and a presence already that they know will translate into sales. People will want to hear what you're saying. But for the rest of us, I mean, you do as well. So that's going to be a different thing. Like they're going to push you a bit more and and a bit harder. But for the average person who's just thinking, I want to get my book out there, don't count on them doing a a book tour for you. I did my own book tour, created a seven city tour. You, You you can't count on them to do press. I reached out to press uh, and I said, Hey, I haven't heard anything from anybody. This is like three months and four months in advance. And they're like, Oh, they're going to reach out to you a month before. And I was like, Oh, so that means no long leads. Okay. You know, yeah, so you know what? I still like to operate like nobody's doing anything for me anyway. Like I never That's count good. on the fact that somebody's going to 
you know, be behind me and be a machine behind me. Yep. I always still try to make sure I set things up on my own. I have a marketing background also. So it might mm-hmm. be just part of the hustle in us to be able to do that. I also have yep. a marketing yeah. background. Look at us. Look at yes! us. Look at us. <laughs> 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 no, but it, I think that is a great way to go about things. Uh, even, you know, I never depend on somebody's going to set this up for me or do this for me because I've seen too many situations where we have those anticipations and it doesn't happen the way that we want it to. So I'm very like in control of what it is that I do so I feel you though you're right because I have a platform every single day where I could be promoting something and so Mm -hmm. I know that's helpful and that's attractive because I do have book publishers talking to me right now but um, yeah (laughs) yeah, but I do you know I I also don't like to do traditional things and I know a lot of times that means that you kind of have to venture out on your own and create things and I enjoy that part of it Mm -hmm. What do you mean when you say you don't like to do traditional things like you wouldn't want to do it like a traditional book publisher? You don't want to do it on your own. Oh, no, I mean, as far as marketing. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like how you set up your, you know, I need new friends. Like that's something different that a book publishing company might not come up with, you know, to put you on that. That's something that you could do yourself. Right, right. No, that's true. And that's the thing that people got to understand, too, especially if you're trying to go the entrepreneurial route or, you know, freelance or independent. You have to be innovative. Yes. You have to be creative. And if you're not one of those people that's constantly thinking of things to do, you better have somebody on your team that is. Because if not, you're going to get left in the dust mm-hmm. and people are going to just outpace you because they're always thinking of the next thing that they could do. Like even me coming into podcasting, I didn't come into podcasting saying, oh, I'm just going to create a show like everybody else. No, I'm trying to mix things up. I'm trying to do things different because I want to bring something to the table. Like I did a live coaching session on my podcast where one of my listeners got a professional coach to coach her. And I just sat there and listened. And that was beneficial for her as well as for the audience. I don't want to just do the normal things. And you can't just do the normal things when you're trying to make your mark, basically. Yeah, you know, I think, too, that part of your success and part of the success of a lot of people who are doing what we're all doing is that you're kind of you're relentlessly yourself. You're doing what you enjoy to do. You're using all of your gifts and you're using all of your creativity. I think that if you can make work and hustling be something that is meaningful to you, then it, it makes it a little bit harder to show up every day. Yeah, that's true. Very true. And that's where I knew I needed to go. And I had timed out of where I was, especially just PR, because I didn't feel passionate about it. I wasn't trying to create new opportunities. I didn't have this like um, fire in me that said, you know, let's do this. Let's do that. Have you thought of this? Have you thought? I was just kind of like, "Mm, all right. You know, and that and when you start to feel like that, you know it's time for you to change some things and you need to figure out what's really going to work for you because this is not working anymore. Wow, that's a word if I've ever heard one. (laughs) Ayana, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. If you have, um, do you have any words of encouragement or a mantra that you want to leave our listeners with? Absolutely. Thank you, ladies, also for having me. I can't wait for our brunch. Yes, yes. I know, and all my new friends. (laughs) Hello, yes. Um, You know, one thing that I say that I got from uh, the You Are a Badass book, um, it's just I love those books. That's good. Yes, yes. I love it. And th- when I say this, um, I say this daily and it just puts a smile on my face. It says, I receive all the good that life has to offer me. Mm. And when I say that, it just, even if I, if somebody's annoying me and I say that, I start to smile. I'm like, it's all right. I receive all the good. You know what I mean? So I think that's something that you could just use. If you feel like you're in a negative space or down or anything, you just start saying that daily. It's just going to start pulling the positive energy out of your situation and out of you. All right. I'm going to have to say that 25 times a day. <laughs> Hello. I know. I'm already seeing all the people in my head. I have to say that. About. <laughs> um, can you let us know where we can find out more about you and all your ventures? Absolutely. So everything is housed at switchpivotorquit.com. So you can connect with me there. And on social media, the place that I guess I really like to play is Instagram. So that's just at switchpivotorquit. Amazing. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You as well. Thank you, ladies. Thanks, Ayana. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Whether you're freelancing, chasing your dreams, or just fighting to break through the glass ceiling and climb that corporate ladder, there's going to be wins and losses. We didn't get to where we are today without experiencing tons, and I mean tons, of setbacks (laughs) alongside the major victories that we've gotten a chance to celebrate. 
I know. I love thinking about all my failures because one, it keeps me very humble. <laughs> and two, it also just like shows you how far you've come. And uh, there's no shame in failure. It's okay not to figure something out because you're learning and you're figuring it out. And it's a learning experience. I don't even call it failure. I just call it learning. That's what it is because nobody is going to succeed at something every single time. But one of the most important things is to make that effort. Yeah, I just think that like for um, I know that I feel this a lot as a woman and I definitely feel it a lot as a minority that I have to be excellent all the time. So if, if I don't shoot a three pointer, mm -hmm. I feel like I've come short, which is not fair to myself. And it's not true. But um, I don't know, like, let's go into specifics. Like, what are specific places where you feel like you've fallen short before? I think when I was younger, there was a period of time when I was doing a lot of freelancing and I had like big chunks of money. And I just think back to when, because I'm from Brooklyn, if I would have been able to take the stack of money that I had when I was younger from freelancing and buy something instead of just blowing it, which mm -hmm. I did, I would be in such so much of a better position today if I would have known, oh, I've had some financial advice on what I should be doing with my money. But instead of investing, I just was always spending my money just all willy nilly. I know. I, uh, I really identify with that. <laughs> I feel like if I had gotten a credit card maybe 10 years earlier, instead of just like paying for everything with cash and on debit, I would have, I would have been really far, far ahead with like my own credit score and my credit journey. And if instead of just like blowing money on vacations and bailing friends and family out, I had actually saved, I'd had like a real savings plan, I wouldn't have been in a lot of financial failure that I was in. I think another mistake that I made a lot when I was starting up is that I never said no. I took all sorts of work. Uh, I still make that mistake. And, and I didn't do any of it really well. You know, I was just like really stretched and... Uh, Jack of all trades, master of none. Exactly. I'm like, there's some work I'm not proud of. And, uh, and I did it. And sometimes I got paid and sometimes I didn't get paid. But I was like, I did not deserve any of it. <laughs> I mean, it seems like a lot of mistakes that we may do have to do with finances. Because another thing that I did was leave one job to take another job for more money. And that turned out to be one of the biggest mistakes. But I learned that so early in life that I think it was an important lesson for me to learn. I had a job that I really enjoyed, but then I had another job offering me $10,000 more than what I was making. And at that time, that was a huge bump <laughs> for me and I needed the money. And in retrospect, I wish I would have gone back to my boss and asked for more money because I knew I had another offer instead of taking it because it turned out to be a nightmarish type of job for me. And I did miss my old job. And I do sometimes even wonder, well, what if I would have stayed there? You know, so I think that's one lesson that I learned that it's not always just about the money. That's true. I have also quit a job without another job lined up and with no money saved. I was like, that's the crazy, <laughs> crazy 20s. Like, I'm going to be fine. And then it took me a really long time to get a job after that. I just I was in really, really bad shape. And also I left my other job in um, in a really bad place where I was like, that's a connection that I'll never have again. It's a it's a job referral that I can never use again and a lot of stuff. And I think about that a lot, just like being very impulsive in I was like, I'm not happy. I'm going to quit. And I was like, mm, there are bigger considerations at hand here. And you just got to be a little more patient. So but all of the, this to say. Yes. But at the end of it all, look at where you ended up now. I know. Right. But um, sometimes you're just like, I could have ended up here a lot faster or, maybe, I'm just <laughs> or saying, I didn't have to learn those hard lessons that I way. learned a lot of hard lessons but I don't necessarily know that they're like failures it's just that's fair you might have taken that route and it might have been completely different and it might not have been as good sometimes the only way you can learn something is to experience it yourself it's one thing when somebody can tell you something yeah. but sometimes we're so hard-headed and I think especially when you're younger to experience certain things is important part of your growth as a person yeah, I agree with that. I think the only places where I feel guilty is when I let somebody else down. You know, it's one thing if I'm just like, okay, I didn't do this thing right and it was just me. But if I, like, somebody was waiting on me for work or I disappointed them, I think that's something that, like, that's a hard thing to repair later on. But I've been really lucky. I've gone back to all of my bosses. So um, everything you. is cool now. Now, what about some professional and financial accomplishments that you are proud of? Oh, man. Um... 
I'm proud that I run a small media company with uh, my podcast wives. Like that's been going really well. Um, I'm glad that I'm in. I'm proud that I'm in good financial shape after a decade of failing at it. <laughs> We're not saying fail. We're not saying fail after a decade of not doing great at it. Okay, that's of fine. learning. After of a learning. decade of learning. <laughs> after a decade of learning, it's true. Um, I, what else? I don't know. Just, you know, the fact that I get to do what I want to do every day. I think that that's something I'm really proud of, that I've built a career where I can actually like chase my own passion and Mm -hmm. uh, still pay rent. I think for me, it's for the past, I would say about like nine, no more than that, probably the past Whew, maybe like 14 years. I've always made more money every single year than I had the year before. That's great. And that's for me, 14 years consecutively for that to happen. That means that I'm actually having a lot more value. And mm. this particular year, I am trying to make sure that I work smarter and not harder, as they say. <laughs> so that's important. I'm proud of the fact that I have been researching and trying to make sure that I up my um, financial IQ, so to speak, because there's a lot of things I don't know. And I think it's important to know that you don't know yep. so that you can get that information. One of my biggest accomplishments was buying my first home. And to this day, like living in Brooklyn and seeing the value of the real estate, I still have the apps that shows me what every house is going for in my neighborhood when they sell a house, when a house goes on the market. So I can just see the value of me having my own home, Mm -hmm. how important that has been. Because honestly, when I was younger, one of my biggest fears, I wasn't making a lot of money for so long, was that I would didn't know what was going to happen when it was time to retire. Where am I going to live? And so now I feel more comfortable in the decision that I made as far as buying a two family house and having income coming in at the same time that really helps me with my mortgage. So that was a great decision. The neighborhood that I bought in was a great decision because, you know, I live in Bed-Stuy and that neighborhood just keeps on continuing. The value keeps on going up and up and up. So it was a smart financial decision. So that's one of my biggest accomplishments that I'm most proud of. Have you learned from successes or we're not saying failure, learnings <laughs> <laughs> of people that you admire in your circle? Absolutely. I think it's important for you to have people around you that actually inspire you to do better, because if not, then why are they around you at all? I want to inspire people. I want them to inspire me. I want to learn from you. I want you to learn from me. And that's super important. I've been trying to make sure within my circle of people, I'm always expanding and learning things from other people, even opening a juice bar, knowing Styles P and seeing what he's done with his other three juice bars. And then me going to him and saying, I want to learn how to do this also has been a great benefit to me to have him as like my brother in, in what it is that I'm doing. So all the time, I think uh, Stacy Tisdale, I do this Wealth Wednesday thing with her at my juice bar and I've been learning from her. I have my book club. There's just so many people that are around me that I get inspired by every single day. And that's important to me. Yeah. What about you? Um, I am really lucky that the people that I consider my uh, my personal board of directors, <laughs> they're, uh, they're really honest about things that are working and things that are not working. And I think that instead of cultivating a mentality that like, oh, hard work is all you need to, to get there, I've seen them stumble and I've seen them pick back up. And I think there's something like very generous about being really honest with people about where you are instead of just like showing them the good parts. So that's been really, really inspirational to me. And, you know, and I can even think about like old bosses who whenever I was doing poorly would they would give me examples of when they had messed up and they were like, don't be afraid. Like, it's okay. Like we're all learning here. Nobody expects you to be perfect. And I think that especially when you're coming up, it's good to have that because you put too much pressure on yourself if you don't see it and you think that you're somehow more deficient than everybody else. And it's like, no, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. As long as you learn something from it, like it's going to be fine. And even mentally, one of the biggest conversations we've been having is about your mental health and having people that you can talk to and be honest with yeah. about what's going on in your life. So that's why you need people like that who you can trust to have around you. That's all the time we've got this week. Make sure to check back in in two weeks when we'll be answering your questions. We'll also be talking to the guys from Paychecks and Balances and Millennial Money Expert Tanya Rapley of My Fab Finance. Oh, I love her. 
She is great. As always, you can join in the conversation using hashtag live colorful with two L's at the end or leave us a voicemail on our colorful lifeline at 646-580-0576. So send us a tweet or leave a message and let us know about your side hustle. Colorful Lives, presented by State Farm, is a Loudspeakers Studios production. Colorful Lives is produced by Matt Raz, executive producer Chris Murrow. Our engineer and editor is Dwayne Crawford. For more information on Colorful Lives and other Loudspeaker shows, follow at LSN Podcast on Twitter or Loudspeakers Network on Facebook and Instagram. Colorful Lives.